uh, much has been said of this session having been a disappointing session, but I would tend to disagree. I think that really depends upon your view of the proper role of government. And if you think that government's meant to be limited, taxes lower, markets open to, you know, the free markets as opposed to picking winners and losers, and you know, I think this year was a very successful year and maybe one of our best years in a long time. You know, a lot of what was in front of us this year had to do with working towards things that are opposite of that political point of view. So I think one of the biggest successes of the session was not to expand our budget by a billion dollars, not to expand Medicaid. And uh, by not doing that, that works towards the idea of limited government. You know, we did pass a tax cut. Um, it, I would say it's not tax cut in a traditional sense in that it's not, not going to have a profound impact on people's personal balance sheets in, in year one, year two, year three. But as structure, what it does is it allows, it slows the rate of growth of government. Our budget increases every year between two to $400 million. And the tax cut is structured essentially would phase in at $80 million a year over a 10-year period. Uh, so for those of you who are fans of slowing the, the size of government, I think it's very successful in that, right? Uh, there were a tremendous list of new targeted tax credit programs. Uh, you can pick your favorite word, winners and losers, crony capitalism. I, I like to use the term corporate welfare. Um, and there was a long list of new programs that were on the table in front of us. And um, with the exception of just one of those programs, which was restructured to where the state could break even, none of those new programs were put into law. And most significantly, we had two uh, relatively large but very high profile tax credit programs, I'm speaking to the land assemblage and new market tax credits, both expired this year. So in the air of expanding tax credits, which you know our redemption levels last year were over $600 million. We began this road 15 years ago at a you know, 10 or $20 million was the start. This is the first time where two programs that were extensively lobbied for failed to be renewed. And it'll be interesting to see the impact of that change. So um, there are some things that were left undone clearly. Uh, the institutional education lobby uh, reared its head and uh, squashed ideas that we had, things like uh, slowing down Common Core. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting alliance. You've got, unfortunately, for the most part, most of the business community around the state, in conjunction with the institutional education lobby, are very much in support of certain things. They're very much in support of Common Core, and they were able in the 11th hour to kill what legislation we had put forward. Uh, quite frankly, um, that legislation was killed in retribution for, the other thing I, I failed to mention is, we killed the 1% sales tax uh, that would have gone before the voters in 2014. And again, I know you're all a well-informed well group here. To put it in context, we, as a state, tax Missourians about $8 billion a year. We have a budget of about $25 billion, but a lot of that's federal dollars and it's matching dollars. So $8 billion a year is what we tax our Missouri citizens, and the 1% sales tax that would have gone forward was $800 million. So it would have been 10% increase on taxation to our citizens, it would have been a 23% increase in the sales tax in Missouri, and there was a small group of us in the, in the Senate that was able to filibuster and kill that legislation, and in retribution for that, Common Core legislation was then killed later in the week. So um, I get, here in the St. Louis area, uh, the media and many of those uh, in business organizations are all bemoaning what a horrible session it was and what didn't happen. And I would just uh, end where I started, which was if your vision of what government should be is limited, small, taxes lower as opposed to higher, markets open as opposed, as opposed to closed, and I think the 2013 session was one of the better sessions that we've had in the General Assembly. I'll uh, just go ahead and add just a couple points to that for the next few minutes. Uh, like Senator uh, Lamping said, the, the session does, um, depending on how you look at it in perspective, it was a good session uh, or a bad session. I've got kind of mixed thoughts on this coming from the House side. I, I was really impressed with a lot of work that the Senate did this year. Um, on the House side, uh, we did pass uh, the good... Uh, the good measure that Senator Lamping talked about, we did pass that out of the House, uh, cutting uh, uh, certain corporate taxes and, and income taxes. Uh, and I think this is good because what this does, for, for, the, for a same body that also proposes constantly new tax credit programs, and I always use this as an opportunity whenever a new tax credit program is up, either in the committee, I sit on the Committee for Economic Development also, um, I wind up voting no in there a lot. Uh, we're 48th in the nation for GDP. Um, 
And so I think that a lot of these programs that we have for economic development don't necessarily contribute to the strength of an economy. I wouldn't necessarily argue that the service sector, uh, growth in the service sector is necessarily a direct indication um, of a healthy economy. I think that it can contribute, but uh, I'm, I uh, kind of am a little bit more of the school of thought that uh, production and manufacturing is a really good foundation for a strong economy. Um, but we're 48th in the nation for GDP, so that would uh, indicate to me that a lot of these programs that we have in order to bring jobs manufacturing to our state aren't necessarily working. And uh, last, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, it was $629 million were redeemed in tax credits. About 499 of those were directly related to economic development or economic incentive tax credits. Well, that's $499 million um, that ultimately comes you know, out of schools and other programs, other core functions of state government. Uh, I don't think that it's necessarily a core function of state government to um, promote economic development through any means other than making sure that we're doing things like protecting people's property rights, ensuring equality under the law and protections of people's liberty equally across the board under the law. Um, we had a bill in our economic development committee, uh, an economic, obviously an economic development bill, and uh, in the bill, it specifically said that it would be okay for municipalities to exercise eminent domain just for the sole purpose of turning that property over to a private developer. Now, last year, we also tried to expand the definition of blight to make it easier for municipalities to uh, commit uh, eminent domain abuse. So I introduced an amendment that would have prohibited that from happening. And in committee, it actually got voted down. And the committee is overwhelmingly Republican. And, it, and I had to tell my colleagues, you know, this is in our platform. Um, it's in our platform. We're not for this eminent domain abuse. Uh, we went to the House floor, and I, I made sure that I just communicated good, and, and uh, it passed in the House. Um, so little by little, we got to make sure that we get these principles of liberty and free markets. Everybody loves the free markets. Everybody campaigns on free markets, at least on the Republican or conservative side. But a lot of times, um, uh, it, it takes it takes a certain degree of education and, and uh, self-motivation to study out a lot of these principles because sometimes when you apply them to policy it can be a lot more complicated than the sound bites that we hear on television. Um, so I, I think that's probably one of my roles and I try to use that as an opportunity that these economic development tax credits, the government is acknowledging that letting people keep more of their own money is a good thing and it's good for the economy but unfortunately what we're doing is we're actually subsidizing some businesses through eliminating their tax liability quite literally at the expense of their competitor. There's a, when I was campaigning in uh, last summer, I met a guy in my district uh, who owns a small business. He had hired eight people. However, one of his larger corporate competitors moved in thanks to a tax credit that they got from our state. And uh, it's really hard for our small businesses to compete um, <coughs> against any type of subsidized industry. And I think the numbers kind of vary, but most people would agree that between 70 and 80 percent of our of uh, employment comes from small business and small business startups. So that's a very viable, very important um, e economic engine is our small businesses. And so we had a bill come before our economic development committee that was for small businesses. Would have been a good economic boost for small businesses. And somebody said that, uh, somebody from the other side of the aisle said that they were voting no on the bill because it's not the role of government to help small businesses. The economic development uh, committee is, is for large corporations is actually what she said. Um, so we took an opportunity, and I got to take an opportunity to help her understand that the real economic engine of, of uh, a viable, strong economy is really our small businesses. And so that's probably what we should do rather than subsidize the tax liability of, large, of the small businesses' larger corporate competitors. Um, I introduced a, a bill this year. You know, our, our tax, and, and this will be the last thing that I mentioned, because so I, I, I would love to just go on about everything I have in this session. Um, but here's something that uh, kind of kind of something new, and I got a little bit of help from the Show Me Institute on this. Um, our tax brackets were instituted in uh, 1931, and they've never been adjusted for inflation. So I introduced a bill this year that would have that would adjust our income tax brackets for inflation since 1931. Now I knew the fiscal note was going to be huge, okay? But the thing is, I wanted that fiscal note to make a, I needed that fiscal note to make a very important point. The fiscal note on that bill, if we would have had been adjusting for inflation since 1931, uh, the fiscal note on that bill, the, how much more money our taxpayers are paying in taxes every year due to inflation is $2.4 billion. So the size of our government has grown by $2.4 billion due to the monetary policy at the federal level, which is why it's important for our states to weigh in on these measures. It's part of the federalism, the checks and balances between state and federal government. Because 
their monetary policy and the actions of the Federal Reserve directly impact our taxpayers in our state and the financial position of our state also. So um, that bill is not going to pass, <laughs> $2.4 billion <laughs> fiscal note. But what I, what I am going to do, though, and I introduced it on an amendment this year on another bill that didn't pass, but I'm going to do it again next year, is make sure that we, from this point forward, we begin to adjust for inflation. And of course, for most people, we're not going to have a direct impact right away, but maybe over the next 70 years, um, we'll be able to prevent the government from going by another $2.4 billion. Um, so a couple things that I've noticed from the session, uh, just a couple things that I've worked on. Thank See, you. Paul and I both sit on an economic development committee, and we both vote no a lot. Uh, we think economic development, our job is to have the most perfect playing field. I'm a big soccer fan, so I want to have the most perfect economic playing field we possibly can in the state of Missouri, and let the teams go on the field and play and compete and win. Some people will win, some people will lose. But that, we're in the minority. The majority uh, opinion of what economic development is, is to focus on one specific industry, one specific part of the state, and then direct monies to that one industry, that one state. And this concept of having this extraordinary, perfect playing field is one that's, that idea is only shared by a few. It is ironic we both said on economic development where <laughs> that committee is focused almost exclusively on targeting monies as opposed to creating this perfect pitch, if you will. Are you ready for some questions? Sure. All right. Um, anyone have any questions? Oh, well, we're done already? <laughs> <laughs> sure, we're done. <laughs> Jeff, I'll start with your last sure. comment about perfect playing field. <laughs> what happens that playing field isn't observed when you cross the board? I'm sorry? You, you can cross the board with another state. Right. Uh, and you don't have the same concern about the perfect playing field positions that we're seeing here. Well, I guess what maybe what you mean by that is, I mean, we can only control what we can control. So we can tr control the economic landscape that is Missouri. And uh, to the extent that one of our nine border states create a short-term incentive for businesses to leave our playing field to go to theirs. If they actually decide to go to this approach of, you know, let's pull people away by through financial incentive, well, you know, I tell people that uh, my term is short in nature, Paul's is two, mine is four, but the policies we're trying to pursue are intermediate and long-term success. And so I'm, con I'm confident that over intermediate and long-term period of time, if ours is the best economic playing field, that those companies that are attracted by other states' short-term incentives, that something will happen. I mean, it could happen to us. We've got this situation where, um, you know, $500 million going to economic incentives, that's a significant percentage of an $8 billion budget. At some point, it's relatively unsustainable without increasing taxes, which, again, that, you know, what, what I heard over and over again from my Republican colleagues on transportation needs is that there's no more <laughs> money left inside the budget. We have to get, bring 10% more into the budget. So. I would, you know, much is made of the border wars. Um, Kansas is pursuing very aggressive, and it's interesting because they're pursuing combination of these two approaches. So they have created, um, in my mind, a very sh strong playing field while simultaneously pursuing targeted tax credits. And, um, you know, I spend a, a significant amount of time now on the western border, and I will tell you that uh, in, the sh in the short run, that state is succeeding. I, I would just add to that by saying that, um, like my drill instructor used to say, the proof's in the pudding, you know? We're 48th in the nation for GDP. We've had these programs for decades. It's not bringing jobs and manufacturing to our state. Um, so, yeah, we can have these short-term incentives. It's kind of like the TIFs. We have companies, businesses that follow TIFs around, and I think that what that does is it stabilizes consumer confidence because we don't know if we're going to have longevity in, in a business or a particular market in our state if they're coming here for just a short-term investment. What we can do to bring them here is say, hey, if you come here, we'll let you keep more of your own money, just like your competitors, so you can actually compete in the market rather than just competing for tax incentives. I'd rather them compete in the market and let them know that they have confidence in our laws, that our laws are going to be applied equally across the board, and that they're going to have just as much protection as their competitor, and we're not going to subsidize their competitor. Sir? Uh, just to switch subject a little bit, um, Congressman Courtman, why would the legislation, legislature spend time and energy on the foreign law bill that just got vetoed by Nixon. Mm -hmm. Why would you guys spend time? I think that there's an important concept. There's an important principle here. I would, I think that most people would probably agree that there's a lot of people that have been elected to government that don't actually uh, go there with a sense of purpose. And a lot of times when people go into government, into elective office, or into a, uh, get appointed to a particular bureaucratic mm -hmm. position, um, they don't understand the proper role of government. 
And so I think that it's important from time to time for us to have certain intro bills that are introduced that do set good policy, but also give us an opportunity to expound on the proper role of government, which is, according to our Declaration of Independence in the second paragraph, just to help keep people free. Um, uh, the Foreign Law for American Courts bill um, doesn't Right? It's up to the legislature to set policy for the judicial branch. That's part of the checks and balances of our government. And right now in our state, we don't have any policy that dictates the application of foreign law. So, we, so what we did was we introduced one bill that said that our courts can use foreign law because sometimes it's appropriate. But the only time where the courts can't use foreign law is if the application would deprive one of our citizens of a constitutional right. And if I may, too, um, to the first part of your question, there's this phrase that people use on when they don't like, maybe you don't like this idea, of, of spending time or wasting time. Yeah, that's well, let me tell you, we have way too much time, okay? <laughs> so I have filed, so, so there's, no, there's no wasted time. I mean, I have filed legislation each of the past two years to reduce the session from 18 weeks to 12 weeks. You've got states of comparable size economies, comparable size states like Virginia, they meet for eight weeks. Um, you've got states like Texas that meet for 90 days every other year. Um, so uh, the first year I filed this bill to go from 18 weeks to 12 weeks, it actually got floor time. It was one, it was one of those interesting aha moments for me personally. See, 90 percent of what I offer comes from my mind and the staff and good ideas and thinkers such as yourselves. They're my own ideas. Uh, so I got this bill to the floor two years ago, and I said, well, what do you, who, who brought you this idea? Who, who thinks we should go to 12 weeks? And I said, I think we should go to 12 weeks. Um, we, we spend way too much, we have way too much time in our hands. Now, I will tell you that this year's Senate put more time on the floor than any Senate since the Republicans were in office. What had happened my first two years is that we would get down there on Monday at 4 o'clock, and by 5 o'clock, everybody would be out to dinner someplace, and on Tuesdays, we'd be done at 3 o'clock. And you know, I'm a very busy person. I'm a father six. I work on both sides of the state. I have two different jobs. And I'm down in Jeff City to do Jeff City-like things. So anyway, my point is that this is, a very, this is a very common thing that I hear over and over again. And you can dislike that law. That's fine. I appreciate that fact. But the idea that we're wasted, why would you spend time? That opening phrase, why would you spend that? The answer is, we got ungodly amounts of time. And, and, and if, you, if we go to an eight-week session and then we you know, take up bills like this, then your point is better taken. That in, you know, uh, to actually do a budget might take, what some states do is they do a, a two-year budget one year, they legislate the second year. So, um, so we, we have way too much time in our hands as it is now. And, uh, and I, I will file this bill for a third time and for the second consecutive year, it won't even get to the floor because my colleagues like being down in Jeff City. Um, that's, I guess my uh, assumption was that some of the bills that didn't get passed didn't get passed because you guys ran out of time. No, that's not true. <laughs> no, 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 that's how it works. No, what happens is, is that bills, uh, uh, bills have to move through the process. Bills have to move through the process. And uh, bills can be stopped at anywhere along the process. So, for example, the very fact that the transportation tax came to the Senate floor on the Tuesday of last week, that was purposeful. Uh, had, had people in the House really wanted that to pass, they'd have got it to the – actually, they could have taken it up and passed it without changing it. They made two very small changes to it. And they could have gotten to the Senate weeks and weeks earlier than that. So, um, no, there's – a bill can not be assigned to a committee. A bill can stay in committee. A, a bill can be passed out of committee but not read back into the Senate. A bill can get to the Senate calendar, never get to the floor. A bill can get to the floor, can be filibustered for 15 minutes, be laid over, only to die again. No, 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 no. Every, <laughs> every bill that was, that, was, that was designed in the leadership's mind to have a chance to pass, had a chance to pass. And um, all those things that you were in favor of that are stuck in some committee somewhere, <laughs> it wasn't because of lack of time. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that particular bill didn't take hardly any time at all. When I introduced it on the House floor for the Senate sponsor, we didn't even have any debate. Nobody even wanted to talk about it, except I think one person might have spoke on it, maybe. I can't even remember. But we were on the floor for maybe three minutes. And sometimes they introduce these bills. Sometimes they bring bills to the floor because they're preparing for another bill that's a little bit more important. There's, there's a whole host of reasons why they'll bring bills. And that was an example of a bill that found its way to the General Assembly at least three years ago. And when it finally got through the General Assembly this year, it was dramatically modified. And in the Senate, the, in the Senate, you can uh, three or four senators can filibuster just about anything. There are 10 Democrats in the Senate. So had they desired to filibuster and kill that bill, they certainly could have, desi they could have done that. So they chose not to. They chose to let it come to a vote. They knew in the back of their minds that, this, uh, that the governor would veto that bill. Yes, ma'am. How do we stand with Common Core then now? What's Common Core now? 
good question. So um, uh, to the extent I know you're all pretty well informed, and, and James here at the Show Me Institute has done a good job of educating on Common Core, and I, I'm very concerned. Um, the for those of you, very briefly, uh, uh, 45, 47 states adopted Common Core standards in 2009, 2010. They were incented by the federal government as a way to either uh, apply for race to the top dollars or to opt out of No Child Left Behind, which is the last federal economic disaster, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. education disaster. So they were coerced and coerced into doing this, and the standards had not even been written. Um, and as you may or may not know now, the first set of standards uh, for English and for math were released in the third quarter of last year, um, oh, excuse me, uh, 12. And, um, and education is full speed ahead. So uh, all across the country, um, almost all, all, you know, again, 47 governors decided to do this. I think we're down to 46 or 45 states that are actually going forward. Uh, and this is it's a very difficult um, thing to push back against because you have institutional education, which is the single strongest lobby in Missouri's General Assembly. They have all the Democrats. They have a significant percentage of Republicans. Uh, we don't have veto-proof majorities in the House on that issue, nor in the Senate on that, on anything education related. And they're very much for it. So what we attempted to do this year, initially, we filed bills in both the Senate, I was the sponsor in the Senate and the House to say, stop Common Core, took the temperature of the, of the building, no way that's even going to get closed. The bill we put forward was simply to educate, to have the, the Department of Education educate parents about what, in fact, is Common Core. They would be required to produce a financial analysis as well as a data collection um, summary and then go to each of the eight congressional districts. And um, that was one of those things that was, it, it didn't pass because the House held it up until one o'clock on the last day. It passed the Senate um, by a very wide majority, I think 30 to three or 30 to two. So that's, that's dead. So now what does that mean? Well, it means that the grassroots are going to have to, I mean, this is all grassroots led, not just in Missouri, but in every state that the pushback has been the strongest. The greatest success story is in Indiana. Um, I would ask you to go home and Google two moms, Common Core, Indiana, and there's a phenomenal national review story that describes the exploits of two parents, actually, who were Catholic school parents, because in Indiana they have, in order to get the scholarship, you know, they've got to adhere to state standards, uh, they've got a you know, voucher system, and uh, this is, the Common Core standards are going to apply to all schools, um, if not directly, indirectly, so uh, the ACT, SAT uh, courses will all be structured with Common Core in mind, so this is going to impact 100% of education in our state, and I am very concerned. The only thing we've got, the biggest thing we've got going for us is they will need to be funded additionally next year. So the uh, Common Core will be um, begin in 2014-2015 school year. So in next year budget, budget process, they will be in front of the, uh, right now we budget about $3 billion to K through 12, and the estimates for technology, because we've got 2,800 schools that don't have broadband, as well as hardware, uh, all the tests in Common Core are online. So the, um, the estimates are about $300 million, $400 million would be ne necessary. Now, quite frankly, I think with the, with the dumps will now, they spend a lot of money on Common Core without telling the appropriators that's what they're doing. They've done a lot of professional development, spent a lot of money that way, and they've spent uh, money inside the budgets they have today, meaning public, school, public schools have. So it may very well be that they kind of come up next year and say we don't need three or $400 million. Um, they're that dead set on having this happen. So uh, it's going to be an interesting thing to watch both in our state and then um, in our state, where I think our governor is completely in support of Common Core, though he hasn't said so, uh, it'll be just as important to see what happens in states like Indiana, where the governor is against Common Core, and there's a better chance of, um, of repeal. Mm -hmm. Sir? Um, speaking, of, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking of education, can you, uh, both of you, comment on the impact of uh, tax credits on education funding in this state? I probably wouldn't be the best one to. Well, I, I, then I will then. Um, well, it, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting um, how we place in the debate we place tax credits versus education. And in this sense, because we, the um, every so often, you, typically after a lawsuit, the state will s uh, sit down and they will go to the pro go through the process of redoing their education funding formula. We did it in 1983. We did it in 2005. Where we, we should be doing it right the last two years. Um, it's if you think about it, if you have a, a, hundred, a pie that's a certain size and you've got a formula and then all you're going to do is keep the same size pie and then split it up um, differently, then you're taking money away from somebody and giving money to somebody else. And po politicians hate doing that, right? So, so they have a really hard time telling somebody no and then somebody else yes. 
So every time they do a funding formula, they grow the pie. Uh, so they can tell people, well, you're going to get the same. You're just not going to get more money. So in 2005, they grew the pie theoretically and in law, quite frankly. And they did is they put in a five or six year fa phase in of what they decided in future legislatures would actually contribute towards education funding. So you'll often hear that we have, um, we're underfunding the formula by $600 million. So what the 05 legislature did is they said by 2013, we will be contributing $3.6 billion towards education funding. And, um, and it, it was a way for them not to have to t take any money away from anybody else. Uh, we're, we're below that number, obviously. We're at $3 billion versus $3.6 billion. We're actually, the formula itself in statute describes how those money should be split in case of the fact that we're not fully funded. Now, what's happened up till now is the Department of Education actually has ignored the law and has allocated the monies as they see fit. So we're overdue a lawsuit. Uh, it's a very easy lawsuit to win. Uh, it's, it's, it's in law, so how the Department of Education allocates monies today is not consistent with the law. Um, those that are hurting the most, though, by this reallocation, unfortunately, there's a lot of theories about why the lawsuit doesn't come forward, and one of them is that one of the people that, hurt, that, that get hurt the most are districts like the St. Louis City School District, and they're loath to take on the Department of Education. So they need the Department of Education to re achieve reaccreditation, so the last thing they want to do is sue the group that they need to get reaccredited. Um, who knows? I'm hopeful that somebody will take up and um, will take up and sue them. Now, see, so what happens is, is that people say, well, there's $600 million gap between the funding formula and what we're funding. There's $600 million in tax credits, and wouldn't it be nice to take $600 million in tax credits and to fund that gap and be at $3.6 billion? Well, look, um, I think that um, it, it's, in my mind, that would more than not likely just be good money after bad. I mean, we, we have this $3.05 to education is a record amount of money we've ever sent to education. Education has done no reforms. We have 530 school districts. We have over 100 school districts that have less than 100 children in the entire district. And the way the formula is structured is that once you get to 100 or less students, because it's all per pupil funding, then you get funded as if you have 100 students. I mean, that's a simple uh, uh, example of how reform could occur. But again, there's no willingness to uh, uh, reform. There's just a willingness to grow how much money you allocate to an inefficient system. So I would suggest, in my mind, that, that $500 million that's going to economic development, well, that, that could go to roads. Okay? So, so rather than having $500 million go to targeted tax credits, and much is made of the fact that we don't have any money for, to build our infrastructure, well, well, yes, we do. We've got $500 million that are going to target tax credits just as easily be going to roads. But the response to the General Assembly, more often than not, is, well, that would be taking $500 million away from somebody else. Let's instead ask the taxpayers to give us $800 million more and go to roads. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sir. I'm going to direct this one to Representative Kirk. Very good. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Part of our reason to exist as a country is to promote the general welfare. We had uh, bills in the legislature this past session which would have um, uh, given insurance to 300, over 300,000 people that are insured. That would have uh, created conservatively 24,000 new jobs in the state. And as a side benefit, saved hundreds of lives. How does defeating that promote the general welfare? What bill, what bill are you speaking of? Talking Medicaid expansion. Oh, the Medicaid expansion? Um, well, I think there's a, a couple, couple things to consider here. When, it, when we talk about promoting the general welfare, I think that uh, what popular culture, the terms that popular culture uses to define those are a lot different than uh, what our founders used to define those words. And even what uh, the framers of the Missouri Constitution back in the early days of, uh, of our state used to define those words. Um, I would think that I would agree with Speaker Jones on this issue when he said, I heard him say on the radio that this is a big deal and probably what we need to do is we need to maybe have some Medicaid reform before we actually expand the program because right now uh, through different studies we've been able to find about 30% of the program that's very open and susceptible to fraud and corruption. In fact, the governor was asked about this by one of my Republican colleagues in a room that I was standing in and the governor even himself said that he would be uh, very much in favor of Medicaid reform before Medicaid expansion. I think before we put the taxpayers on the hook for what could be a $100.4 billion shortfall 
um, in 10 years once the, uh, the federal government begins to come back down on the amount that they're going to fund it. Um, I think that it would probably be prudent and it would probably be responsible of our legislature to make sure that we have good reform before we actually try to uh, reach out and expand the program, in which, which we're all for reform, and, and even the governor said he was for reform also. But the thing is, is reform has to come before the expansion. And, and I, I would even, if I may, uh, the premise of your question that we would save lives and, and that, you know, I, I really, I follow, I try to be as research-based in my thoughts as I can possibly be, and you sound like you're an informed, you're here today, so you're an informed constituent. Um, you know, you look at the study, New England Journal of Medicine study on the state of Oregon, that just came out within the last 90 days that was the first time ever where you actually had, for those of you who aren't aware, again, this is a really good study to go find out about, where Oregon basically expanded Medicaid four or five years ago, but they didn't have enough money to, to expand it to everybody. So they had a lottery. So they, had, they were able to take a, a, a live study and they had 6,800 people that were in Medicaid and 6,800 people that weren't in Medicaid. And what they found, and this is not, this is causing a lot of issue with the point of view that Medicaid saves lives, is that the health of the, 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 the test group didn't improve at all. That, that more money was spent on health care, so uh, more money was directed to health care. The people that had Medicare, they, they, um, emotionally they felt more sense of relief because they, they, Medicaid, excuse me, Medicaid, they mm -hmm. felt more sense of relief because they, they had financial security in their minds, but the health of the two groups was not changed significantly at all. And this is, this is a, this is a science-based, research-based, very highly accredited journal re re report that really does call into question this idea that Medicaid, in fact, does save lives. It, it, and so I think the, jur uh, the jury's way out on that concept, the idea that the well-being of the community is not necessarily uh, what people might think it otherwise would be with the expansion of Medicaid. I was citing the statistics provided by a study done by the University of Missouri for the state of Missouri, not for Oregon. The, the Oregon is a live scientific study. The uh, University of Missouri is a thesis. In, in, in addition to that, real quick, I, I just like to add that um, we know that the state would suffer a certain shortfall. We'd, we're going to have to come up with the money to, to fund what the government decides that it, the federal government decides that it's not going to fund, you know, ultimately over the next 10 years. Um, and in, quite frankly, I just don't trust the federal government. I don't, I don't trust them that they're going to be able to fund everything that they say they're going to fund. And especially in light of a lot of recent events, I have less reason to trust them now than I did before they said they were going to fund us. In the state of New York actually commissioned a panel to study the expansion of Medicaid, and they appointed two co-chairs. One was a previous lieutenant governor of the state of Missouri. The other was Paul Volcker. Now, I, I'm a huge Paul Volcker fan. He's, like, he's the rock star in the economic world as far as I'm concerned. And he's also, but he's also a man of D.C. You know, that's where he's based. Uh, uh, he's a man of Washington, D.C. So he knows what's going on in Washington, D.C. And so they took a look at the expansion of Medicaid, and they came back, and the lieutenant governor said, oh, of course we should expand Medicaid. And Volcker said, under no circumstances should you expand Medicaid. And he said, and the reason for that is this, the way it works, this expansion is going to be phased in to where at the end of the five-year period, it's a 90-10 split. He said, that's never going to happen. Every single deficit reduction bill that exists in D.C. today, the first place they start is that 90-10 split. That you know, you have states like Illinois right across the border that have 100. They they already have medicated 133 percent of poverty. Their split between the federal government and the state is 50-50, and there are a lot of other states. There's 14 other states that have at least 133 percent of poverty. Their splits are 50-50. So Volcker said, look, this is a pipe dream. There's no way at the end of the phase in period this will be 90-10. And when I sat down with um, Linda Lubering, who's the budget director for the governor's office. And they very conveniently uh, have, it look, have it work out to where at the end of the sixth year, it's a break even to the state. I said, well, that's wonderful. Okay, what happens when it's not 90-10? She says, well, then we're in trouble. And I said, what's your assumed rate of cost inflation of Medicaid? It's 4%. You know what the actual uh, inflation rate for Medicaid today? It's closer to 8%. So the largest single increase to our cost structure on a percentage basis year over year with respect to the inflation of that cost is Medicaid. Medicaid costs that were the program we're in today, which by the way, we're insuring 850,000 of the 5.9 million Missourians in, the inflation cost of that program every single year is not less than $150 million a year, just the rate of inflation of that program. And we have a 60-40 split, and there's much discussion given to the fact that Missouri is not going to stay 60-40 in the plan we're in today, that we're more likely to move to 50-50. So all of these moving parts and these variables, if you place with, if you say with certainty the government will keep its, its, um, its bargain, well, even then, I would make the case that 
with the Oregon study, for sure, it's, it's not improving health, it's just improving mental health, maybe, and that you've got security. <laughs> but for, I don't I would guess the majority of people in this room don't trust government to keep its bargains with respect to all those variables. Um, you know what, there's a, somebody way in the back with their hand, I can't even see them, and I respect the fact that their hand is raised so high and they're way in the back, so. Okay. It's getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I appreciate that you want to transform and realign Medicaid before expansion. The law was passed three years ago, and the legislature has had time to look at and make the necessary adjustments. And I appreciate the study from Oregon, but the fact that those people didn't get sicker may be a plus on the health care side. So it seems a shame to me whether we trust what will happen on the federal side of things is irrelevant when it's obligatory for Missourians to do what's right for Missourians. Well, I appreciate that. And Diane is very involved in health care issues, and uh, I know her. I, uh, she said, what, what's the commission are you on? Um, mental, the, uh, Maryland family. I, I, I was her Senate sponsor. And, but I would, tell you, I would suggest this to you, that the Oregon study came out in the, the third month of this, of this session. So I would suggest that the, the General Assembly itself hasn't even had time to digest what this study is suggesting. And again, this study, for those that are very big proponents of expansion of Medicaid, this study is very problematic because this is not just, again, the University of Missouri, that was, that was an idea put forward. It's an estimate of what will happen. It's like uh, an, an economic pr um, uh, proposal, what may occur. And this is extremely scientific based. Uh, it's, it, it's, it is very problematic for those that wish to expand when it comes to the idea that this would improve health outcomes. And the question of not getting sicker, it's, it's you know, Often we hear of our country is so unhealthy. We have an obesity problem. We have diabetes. All these issues and issues, mm -hmm. and yet that's in a country where we uh, we spend more on health health care than any other country in the world. Eighty five percent of us, at least eighty five percent of us, have health care coverage through our employers now. So health care insurance doesn't mean you're healthier. It just means you have health care insurance. And so to describe to, to think that by giving someone health care insurance would make them healthier, I think studies like the Oregon study are disproving that thesis. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no, behind you. You already have one, Maria. Um, I wanted to hear both of your take on the sound money um, issue, and I know that didn't go uh, as far as this year, really, as we hoped. I know you both uh, either worked on it or were planning to work on it. Um, so could you... Sure. That was, that was my bill, so I'll uh, just comment on that. Um, there's, there's a little bit of misconception. This bill has kind of become hyper-partisanized, if, if that's a, a word. Um, basically, the, the, sound, the sound money bill uh, uh, would just make room in our statutes for uh, a certain financial, mar a new basically financial market to kind of come into our state. Um, Utah did this in March of 2011. Most recently, uh, the state of Arizona has been exploring it. Um, I introduced the bill last year, and the man who, uh, the entrepreneur who started the business after they made room in the statutes in, in Utah actually testified in, in our committee in Jefferson City. And uh, what this bill would do is, right now, Senator Lampion uh, works in the financial industry. I, work the fi I used to work in the financial industry on a full-time basis. Um, but this bill would allow people to kind of be able to monetize gold and silver kind of to the same extent that we do other investments in money market accounts. Uh, um, it would allow you to take your gold and silver holdings that were minted by the United States government, so there's some assurity there. Put them with a, a new firm, somebody who's opening up a new sector of a, a firm, or, for example, and what that person would do is maybe issue you a debit card, and so if the value of gold and silver goes up, like, like other investments, whether it's in a money market account or some other account, um, you could use your debit card and sexually spend against the value of your investment, and uh, that the holder of, of those commodities would actually sell them on the market in order to cover the cost of the transaction. We already do this with other investments. This would uh, just provide another opportunity. And, the, and not only that, but the business, um, the, the, the idea didn't go very well with the legislature last year, so we, had, we adjusted it this year just to allow that business to still come in and operate um, what would be called uh, a gold-silver depository. And uh, the guy who owns the firm in Utah has, uh, he's, He's expected through 15 contracts that he has over the next 
uh, three years, he's expecting to do about $250 billion worth of business. He has contracts with three central banks, several um, money managers and hedge funds from around the country. And uh, he said that he, he said he's willing to diversify, looking to diversify his business. And he would like to come to Missouri. But the problem is, is we don't have um, room in our statutes to allow that particular business to operate. Because what we need is we would need checks and balances for that type of business. In other words, there'd have to be some governmental oversight in order to protect their investors from fraud and abuse, and yet that would probably be assigned to the uh, Secretary of State's office, for example. Well, um, we've worked with the bankers, we've worked with the financial department in Missouri. Um, they're fine with the bill. Um, it, just didn't, it just didn't make it, uh, it barely made it out of the House, and uh, it didn't make it in the Senate this year. But I think it would be bring jobs to our state. Um, the owner of the firm said he's looking to move out of Utah and put some business elsewhere. Um, it creates no mandate. So I think it's just a, a really good way to save taxpayers money and um, give somebody an opportunity to open up a uh, open up a new business. And it's really the best we can do. The Federal Reserve is monetizing our country's currency, and there's really not a whole lot we can do about it um, other than create opportunities like this. I think we also modified the bill to where we would waive capital gains tax on mm -hmm. currency uh, on precious metal. Uh, holdings transactions over time you think about it you know all of us in this room could decide that you know the currency is going to <clears throat> lose half its value we can move all our money into a precious metal we could be exactly right gold could go from fifteen hundred dollars an ounce to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce and when we monetize it when we sell it to actually go transact business we would owe uh, the 22 percent federal capital gains tax as well as Missouri's six percent capital gains tax so we would have been right we would have protected our currency we've found a better currency and we would have been punished by almost 30 percent uh, taxation on it so uh, it's it, the challenge with this idea is that um, it's a smart complicated you have to think through nobody else is trying to push for it other than Paul in the house and me in the Senate and uh, and so the odds are long, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Back to education. What is your proposed solution to the failing schools that are heavily populated by children who have been traumatized by over-incarceration of their parents and siblings and are still suffering the consequences of historical and ongoing discrimination? Um, I'm very <clears throat> encouraged by the steps that the state of Indiana has taken with respect to education over the course um, of you know, the better part of the last seven or eight years. I think that that step-by-step uh, -step process that the governor enacted with his supermajorities in Indiana's General Assembly, <clears throat> that's the template for success. I'm here to tell you that in the current state of our General Assembly <clears throat> with a, um, a Democratic governor that unless the public school education lobby writes the legislation itself, <clears throat> excuse me, if I get a glass of water, I'd appreciate that, writes the legislation itself, it will not pass. And I'll give you a very simple example. So in 2012, uh, after 2008, 2009 financial crisis, our state's pension system, and, and by the way, the, um, the Institute put out a phenomenal piece that came from the American Enterprise um, about pensions and the pension liability. So, <clears throat> Um, the, our, our largest pension systems, that educate, the teachers' pension system, one of the largest ones, found itself uh, in the mid-70s with respect to their funding ratio. And their board of trustees adopted a new investment policy. And the investment policy said we're going to essentially freeze our COLA at 2% until, for now, we're going to freeze our COLA at 2% unless inflation is over 5%. And that was the decision that their board made. And the minute that they adopted that, then their funded ratio improved by 7%. Nothing changed, no increased contributions, just they froze their COLA. So um, at that time, I served on the pension committee, and we had a bill that I filed a bill that put forward that said, fantastic job. <laughs> You've made great decisions. We'd like, you, we'd like to codify your decisions until such time that your pension is 100% funded. And which, that's your goal. Your goal is to have your pension be 100% funded. And my three years in General Assembly, this is, only, this is the first, only time this happened. On a Tuesday afternoon, the last motion before you vote on a bill is perfection motion. That's where debate occurs. And the perfection motion took 45 minutes. The bill was perfected. It was done. It was going to pass. It was ready to go. The morning of the vote, the whip came to me and said, Senator, you don't have the votes. And I said, well, Senator, what do you mean? And this passed out of committee, this was perfected, there was no pushback, the institutional lobby didn't rear its head, we're ready to go. He goes, Senator, you do not have your votes. And in all my time in the Senate, 
This is the only bill that was perfected and sat on the third read calendar and never came to a vote. That's how powerful this lobby is. So uh, your question is, is the right question. And uh, it's one, if you think about it, we spend $3 billion of our $8 billion discretionary budget on this topic, K through 12. And the efforts of all of us in the General Assembly to try to get better return for that $3 billion investment, <coughs> they are stifled at the inception stage of legislation being put forward. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Joe. Uh, it seems to me that so much effort uh, is placed on tactical activities in the, in the legislature and in our government, our state government, as well as federal government. And, and you talk about time, that you do have some time, ideally. And, uh, and I'm wondering, do we have anything strategic in our state? We do have a Republican legislature do we have anything strategically that we're looking at do we take you said we're 48th in GDP we've got all these other where are we in education where are we in small business mm -hmm. development uh, the issues you're bringing up if we put ourselves and look at those statistics and then from a strategic standpoint does the does the entire legislature look at where we ought to go as a state to make us better? I mean, we've got issues like no income tax, we've got issues like right to work, we've got issues, all these things that everybody's doing around us. And I think sometimes maybe we focus so much on, well, let's all this little, put our finger in this dike and our finger in that dike and pretty soon we're out of fingers and there's no global plan, strategic plan, to make us better that everybody can latch on to and drive toward. That's what's so frustrating to me. I, mm -hmm. I see it, every business tries to do it, everybody tries to do it, and governments, because of the lobbies, because of all the other pressures, tries to be fixing this and fixing that and, and touch this up and expand that, but, but where do we get? What's the plan to make us better as a state of Missouri? I know exactly um, what you mean about uh, using some strategy to make sure that we can uh, look out over the long term and implement a good plan and take steps or, or take things in increments or phases. Um, one of the problems with this, and, and I wasn't sure exactly how to think about this when I first got to the legislature, um, there's, there's two things that I would consider. One is that not everybody who's there, um, I don't want to sound like, I really don't want to be a pessimist, but quite frankly, not everybody who's in government really cares. Um, that's just a reality that we have to deal with. There's some people, they, they work a job, then they retire, and then they just pursue this as some status that they want to attain. So they're not thinking about long term. They're not thinking about policy or where we can take economic development or where we can take education. They're there, and they feel they warm a seat. Um, the thing that compounds that is the fact that we have term limits now. And so when we're looking at a long, uh, long term plan to maybe bring, take us from 48th in GDP to 28th over the next 20 years, well, we have to understand that the legislature is going to almost fully cycle almost three times by then. And so that 20 year plan is only going to might work for the first eight years if we can keep the majority there um, who was on board with it in the first place. But the people who are always there, the people who are going to be there for 20 years, are the special interest in the lobbyist because they don't go away. They don't, they don't get term limited out. And so what I've kind of seen is this particular cycle in which uh, um, people have good ideas and good plans, but a lot of influence, a lot of really strong, powerful influence can come from lobbyists and special interests. For example, on the tax credit issue, I heard people campaigning. I heard them. We need to get. We need to rein in these out of control tax credit programs. Then the first thing we do when we get there is we cr actually we actually created three more programs, and 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 the the reason behind that is is because there's special interests have they got a lot of influence, and so I think that it's just important to uh and, and there's people that wanted they, there's people there that would like to do these plans and and it's really easy to beat up on legislators um, when they do something wrong 
but not very many people will take the time to compliment you and pat you on the back when you do something right and give you a little encouragement like, hey, stick with it. I know it's tough, but just stick with it. Um, it's really easy because I, I do this all the time. You know, I fall in this trap where something happens, especially at the federal level, you know, and I, you know, go nuts and I want to yell at somebody, right? Um, but, uh, but the thing is, is if we want these plans to work, it takes good cooperation, not necessarily compromising principles, but just cooperating with people and letting them know that uh, the grassroots are going to be there for a long time or institutions like this will be there for a long time to help um, affect change in the long term. Um, but that's part of this uh, strategy. Joe, it's about leadership. Okay, so what you, what you just described was who's, who's leading, you know, who's the CEO, who's the chairman of the board, who's looking at the big picture, getting down to the grassroots. There's a reason why so many of our presidents come from the ranks of governor. And, and it's because it's, I think, quite frankly, it's one of the most, it, it, it's the best test of who may be that person that could actually lead the country. And you look at states that are going hard to the right and states that are going hard to the left. They're being led by their governor. You know, we may all disagree with what Governor Brown's doing. He's leading. You know, uh, you, uh, my fan, obviously, is Governor Daniels. What he did in Indiana, he led. He led with a mixed general assembly when he got there. He led that state in a direction that I think it's, you know, it's one of the best, most improved states in the country. And we have other examples of leadership one way or the other. This governor does not lead. This governor defends. He defends trial attorneys. He defends labor unions. He defends the tax code. He defends the education lobby. He defends. He does not lead. So what happens is, as a result, is you are left with just a pragmatic general assembly. You know, what can we actually accomplish when we know we're going to face a veto in all these areas, we know this idea that we have supermajorities, it's, it's overrated. Um, we, have, we have 109 votes on right to life issues. We have 109 votes in the House on you know, things like the Sharia law bill. But we lose 15 to 20 House members when we take on tort reform. 15 to 20 members, we try to do education reform. 15 to 20 members, and we try to uh, lower the tax burden on our citizens. So we don't have veto-proof majorities. Now, um, I heard a great story. Uh, Oklahoma, which uh, obviously a deep red state. Oklahoma, you may, not, you may know, is the only state in the union that every county voted for Romney, every single county. And a friend of mine was in Oklahoma in the middle of April, and I think Oklahoma's their session meets for, I think, 16 weeks or something. But they had, they had adjourned two weeks early in Oklahoma. They were done. Okay, so there's a certain core things that government can do, that have to do, write our budget, that takes a certain amount of time. And then I would suggest the things that you talked about and the things that I think the governor defends are all areas where we can improve our economic playing field. But we can't get those done. So I just assume, you know, if choosing between really good things that I can't do, governing, which takes eight or 12 weeks, and then doing things that are questionable and dubious, I just assume not do those things at all and get done two weeks early and go home. But unfortunately, that's not the mood. People do like to be down there and do things. So, so we get stuck looking like we tried to do all these things, didn't accomplish anything, when in fact, my opening remarks said it was a very good year for limited government philosophy. So, but no, it's, it, Joe, it's 100% it's leadership. It is, it, you ask this governor today, through his reelection, what direction is it that you want to take the, the state forward in? His economic proposal is, your gentleman, your gentleman, he cites the 24,000 jobs that we would create by expanding the uh, Medicaid. That's his economic plan, um, one that he came to 15 days after his reelection. And on that note. <laughs> <laughs>